So Craig, thank you for taking the time out to join me with this key conversation. This is our second key conversation for the speakers and this year. And how are you today? Uh, good, thank you. Excellent, excellent. So you've given me some pretty awesome questions that you'd like to uh, respond to. And I have them here with me. So the, the point of today's conversation is to give the listeners an idea about who you are as a speaker and the message that you're going to be sharing with the audience at the Speakers Initiates Key Talk that is coming up on September 25th. So are you ready to go through your questions? Yes. Excellent. All right, so we'll start with the first one. What are you passionate about right now? Uh, so right now I'm really into uh, mental health um, and, you know, helping, um, you know, other people who are suffering from mental illnesses to see that you can, you know, live a really good life, um, you know, even with these conditions. Okay. So do you want to share a little bit more about the actual mental health issues or is that something that you want to elaborate on with your presentation? Uh, I'll probably elaborate more about it with my presentation, but obviously there's, um, you know, problems with people getting access to mental health um, services. Um, you know, at the, at the moment, there's uh, extraordinarily long wait times to see a lot of psychologists, um, which, you know, is making it very difficult to for people that need assistance straight away to actually get it. Yeah, sure. That's totally true. I can appreciate that. With my background in psychiatric nursing, I definitely saw wait lists were terrible for people that really desperately needed the help. And often they resorted to some of the worst types of uh, actions to, to help get through, which could have been alcohol, which could have been self-harm, which could have been, you know, isolating themselves and just making things a lot more difficult for people that needed the help. Yeah. And, and the thing is, when you're in these crises, you need help pretty much straight away. And, you know, and, and you know, I, even myself, you know, if I, if I have to call up my psychologist, you know, it's almost impossible to get in to see him outside of my, my appointment hours. Um, so, you know, what do you do in, in that case where, you know, you, you really need to talk to somebody? Um, and I know that there's different services like Beyond Blue and um, all the other ones that do, um, you know, telephone counselling, but I... Me personally, I've never been very big on the telephone counselling part of it. So and that, that might be just a me thing, but... Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And you're right, there are services out there. It's just everyone's uh, with a, for want of a better phrase, horses for courses, you know, certain things work better for certain people. And as long as you know that about your own situation, that's ideal. It means at least you know how better to deal with your... Uh, your needs and your crisis at the, at the time that it's happening. So, yeah, very insightful. Good, good of you to share that. Thank you. So the next question will be, what's a common myth about the thing you're passionate about or this topic that you speak about and how would you debunk the myth? Um, so I've, I've sort of got two that I can, I, I can think of off the top of my head and one of them is obviously I've heard the, the phrase before, you know, suicide is the coward's way out. Oh, um, horrible you know, it, it is and it's you know and these people they i get it they mean well but quite frankly they don't have a clue what it's like um you know especially when you're in that state of mind you know you're not thinking objectively you're not making logical decisions um you know your troubles often seem like you know you're climbing mount everest yeah and, you know, to someone else there might be you know a molehill um and you finally reach breaking point and it's it's the only way out for some people and it's it's awful that it has to get to that stage but it just that's what it is yeah absolutely so there are a lot of myths and it's it's very timely that we're having our conversation today and that you are presenting um in september given that there are two really major campaigns that take place the are you okay day campaign and the World Suicide Prevention Day that took place only two days before that. So it's, it's becoming, I'm finding particularly, a really um, open conversation now. It is like it's, it's reached that tipping point now where people are now recognising that it must be talked about, it is okay to talk about, and we will bumble our way through it, but we will at least make it now that we're talking about it where previously people didn't know how to, so they wouldn't. 
um, that being the people that wanted to help but didn't know how to or those who had the problems and didn't know how to. Would you agree with any of that? Yes, yes, I would. It's, um, you know, it's it, we're definitely getting better with, with discussions around mental health. There's still a long way that we need to go. Mm. Um, but we definitely are, you know, as, as a society, it's more in tune now to, oh, these problems existed. You know, when I was diagnosed with depression uh, back when I was 12, there really wasn't much. You know, I remember the doctors telling my mum, oh, you know, um, I think my mum said to him, oh, you know, could it be depression or something like that? And they're like, oh, no, 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 you know, kids that age don't get depression then. But as we know now, they yeah. actually do. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. And was I, as soon as I heard you saying that, it was like my, my inner spidey senses went off. And I remember dealing with young children that were having enormous difficulties coping with that intense emotional uh, um, grief and trauma that was in their worlds. And it does manifest as depression. They don't know how else to deal with it. So I totally hear you when you say that. Yeah, and you know, and for me, like what triggered uh, a part off was I lost my uh, uh, maternal grandfather when I was about uh, 11 or 12. Um, and I just didn't know how to deal with the grief, to be honest. And I think if I look back at it, that's where my depression started. If I was going to look for a trigger point and say that was it, it was at that point. Um, you know, so you're talking about managing grief and that is it's mm. very, very relevant. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Well, thank you again. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question that we have for you is what led you to this project or the um, profession that you've chosen, this whole stepping up uh, before a microphone? What's led you to this? Well, I've, I've, as I mentioned, I sort of I've had depression since I was twelve and schizophrenia since I was seventeen years old. Um, in my early twenties, there were a number of suicide attempts. Um, you know, I just wasn't really thinking straight, um, and you know, one minute I might be staring at all my medication packets and they'd be full, and then the next minute they'd be empty, and I'd be left with thinking to myself, "What have I done this time?" Um, but uh, what I really want is, you know, now that I'm a, a lot older, you know, that's all that's behind me now, the suicide attempts, you know, I've still got the depression and schizophrenia, but they're under control generally. Um, you know, I want to want to be able to help other people. I want them to see that, yes, you, these, these things are there, you know, mental illness is there. It's not going away for some people. Um, you know, even my psychiatrist has said, you know, I'm a lifer. He said, you, Craig, you're not going to be able to get away with not having medication. Uh, you know, for the rest of your life to make sure that everything's okay. Um, so if I can help one single person with, um, you know, my story, then it was all worth it. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I guess that's really um, why it was so important for me when I was creating the Speakers Initiative to really find people that were in positions to be able to share their stories, whatever those stories were, whatever the cause or the passion, because it is, it's about reaching that one person. It, we, we may have a room full of 100 people, but it may be just that one person in the room who needs to hear the message or who the message resonates with because they either are in the situation or they are experiencing that particular moment. It might be their grief, their trauma, their, their hardship of some kind. And our voices are the ones that tap in and help them to find that, that ray of light, that sense of hope. So you are that sense of hope. That's what we're here for. And I think it's really important that we have the, the confidence to step up. And even though it might be stepping on a stage with a microphone, these days, you know, we're also here today, in, you know, uh, on the, the computers, but it's a way of reaching out. And, you know, I say kudos to anyone, including yourself, for being able to step up and share a, what can be a really deeply personal story and, and be there to help other people. So I think, you know, if we can do that, then let's just keep doing it. That's what these conversations are for. Yeah, well, I've heard from other speakers before where they've said, you know, um, you know, they've had someone that, you know, they were talking about mental health or something and then, um, you know, someone from the crowd later on would come up to them and, you know, would say, oh, you know, your story really touched me and, you know, I was actually thinking about, you know, going home and ending it all, but now I'm going to continue on. And that's just an indication of how powerful you, your story might be to somebody out there who's suffering from a similar problem. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's so important that we keep these conversations going totally. Um, our next question is that many people believe that being a public speaker is fairly challenging. So, you know, why do you think it is that people believe that? I think a lot of people have got a fear about public speaking. You know, there's, they're absolutely terrified of it and they don't know, you know, there's, there's nothing worse to them than public speaking. And I used to be one of those people. Um, I'm not, you know, I always used to say I'm a, a computer engineer by trade. And uh, I, you know, would say to everyone, oh, I just hide out the back, you know, in the cave. Um, <laughs> and they just bring me out every now and then when they need me. Um, but, you know, I've learned that, you know, through all my trainings that, you know, I do have a powerful message and um, I do want to serve my audience and I do want to get out there and, and, and tell my story. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think it's, it's fear for a lot of people. It's just the fear of, you know, oh, am I going to make a fool of myself? Um, you know, am I, I'm not good enough. Uh, you know, people don't want to hear what I have to say. Um, all those sort of things. Yeah, and what if I forget my message and, you know, yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. I shared with yeah. Yolana the experience I had when I was um, in high school um, with the public. Uh, it was called the Plain, in Plain English Speaking Competition. And I was all of, I don't know, I, I probably would have been about 15 and I stood up on the stage with five, uh, four or five other competitors and... <laughs> I was the only one that stood up and completely forgot my lines. I had those little cards that have the written prompters on them that you flip through to remind you. Misplaced them, completely stuffed up. I could not, I just was like a deer in the spotlight. And it was humiliating, to say the least. It was the most shattering experience. And, and, and as I shared with Yolana, there was uh, 400 people staring at me. And I was in just absolute panic because it was school. It was pretty critical time when you're a teenager and things go wrong <laughs> but needless to say I actually challenged myself at the end of the the last speaker and said to the principal I want to get up and, and just finish so he let me get back up and I, I was pretty pleased with myself I finished it and I think I came third after all that so it is I totally get what that fear is like and like you I was terrified it took me a long time to find my voice and to feel that it was okay to step up in front of people so it's a very empowering thing and I can totally understand the fear behind it. But I think when you've got a message to share, it's, it's important to find that training that helps you to step up so that you can share the message because there are a lot of people who need to hear them. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, for, for me, I found that I needed to, um, uh, I would write out my whole speech, you know, word for word. And then I realised that, you know, in my trainings when we had to deliver presentations that, uh, I worked better from memory. Like, you know, if I, if I just sort of had key points and I, as I would go, I would elaborate on those key points. Um, the speeches seemed to be, you know, the presentation seemed to be far better and flow a lot easier for me than if I was trying to remember piece by piece the entire scripted um, presentation. Mm. And it comes with experience as well too. They, look, certainly some of the uh, very high level, um, more ex um, expert speakers, they do speak about uh, or, or their tips, I suppose, would be that, yeah, remember it word for word, not because it's important to rehearse it and speak it word for word, but it is a bit like, and the best, um, I guess the best way that they made me remember it is, you know, the words to your favourite song. Everyone knows that if they've got their favourite song, they can remember exactly word for word. And even though that might only be for three or four minutes that it plays, you never forget the words. And he, the speaker that I was listening to who gave me that advice pretty much said, if you can get yourself into the rhythm of always remembering the words, you find the, the way to have the, the hook and the key message always comes through. And I just, that was really clever. It was a good way. But, you know, we're going from three-minute concepts to our 30-minute presentations that we do. So good luck remembering every single word in a 30-minute presentation. But I think, it, yeah, I agree. Sometimes you just got to have your key concepts there. And when you're confident enough about your message, it comes through. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. good on you for being willing to do it, I say. It's, it's, it's a big step from, you know, the, the trainings that we've done through to taking this big leap. But, hey, in, in those big leaps, that's where the, the learning experiences are. Yeah, definitely. Oh, we've got one last question, though. 
Um, what do you think is the most common reason for people failing or giving up? Uh, I think it's definitely the fear again. Um, you know, you just you, the, all those fears of I'm not good enough and, you know, I, I don't know my words and I'm a terrible public speaker, um, you know, and, and they let that, you know, manifest itself into they work themselves up to a point where they actually believe it all um, and then they just give up on on it, you know. Um, and and you, you do need to practice, you know, a lot. Like, you know, I practice a lot with my iPhone and recording myself and, um, you know, uh, with the video camera to to see how I look and and how the the message comes across, um, but yeah, I definitely think it's it's definitely the fear that stops a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, and fear is quite the cripple um, uh, crippling emotion. It can be the one that cripples people the most. And you know, as as often as said, that fear is quite irrational. Um, although it never seems irrational at the time. You know, it's, it's obviously an innate thing that we have. The fear and the anger are our fight and flight response and they're supposed to be there to, to give us the warnings to save us from danger or get us to escape from danger. Um, and, you know, obviously we feel that fear. I guess that's where that phrase came in, feel the fear and do it anyway. So that's what we're doing. We're getting in there and giving it a go. So, you know, it's, it's a message to, I suppose, whoever might be listening today is that, if you feel like you are scared beyond wits and don't think you can grab the microphone and speak, go and get some training. You know, really obviously get some training. That's what this, this whole message from us is all about. I mean, Craig and I have both had training and uh, anyone that speaks with the speaker's initiative has to have some form of training because we want you to feel comfortable getting up and sharing the message because you've definitely got a message. So... Yeah, if, if if Craig's feeling the fear and does it anyway, hey, let's just let's just you know get in there and do it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. Well, there's only one last question, Craig, and I think it's it's that most important question. What what is it that you do first thing in the morning that gets you started for your day? Um, I usually just uh, I usually take five or ten minutes out, and you know, uh, for me, like I just check the news and. And that sort of stuff just to you know just to see what's going on in the world and then it sort of gives me a, a you know some time to relax and then i just get straight into it um you know whether that's you know mostly everything i do is on a computer these days so um you know it just gives me a bit of extra time before i might start coding or <laughs> or doing something else so cool yeah so do you not a, a must-have morning coffee person um, I can, I, I might have a coffee. It just, it's kind of depends. I'm a bit variable with coffee. It's sometimes I might have it, you know, every day for a week or two, and then I might not touch it again for another, another week. Um, so it's not, it's not a huge thing for me. It's funny. It's funny. There are people that absolutely must have a coffee. Um, and me, I'm a tea drinker. I could drink a pot of the stuff anytime, any day. I'm a bit of a tea, tea junkie, but you know, I think it, the most important thing is those little morning rituals that we have that take us into that, that zone where we can at least get ourselves focused for the day. Uh, for me, it's like I have a particular type of planner where I sit for five to ten minutes and, and plan out more the the state of mind stuff that I need to work through. Um, and, yeah, I think the morning rituals certainly help. So, again, you know, it's one of those things that helps us get through the day and deal with some of the stuff that can come up because, as you, you and I both know, that there's, there's always something that can happen during the day that can take you out of your mind state and you have to be aware of how can you practice to get back into a positive mind state that's going to at least get you through and buffer you against whatever's going on around you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, Craig, so it's not too long now. We've only got a week until you start pre with your presentation for the speakers this year. Are you looking forward to it? I am, yes. Um, I've been practising and um, I'm feeling feeling pretty good about it, actually. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really, really good. And I think it's a message that the audience needs to hear. And so for anyone listening, Craig's going to be talking about his experience with mental illness and a, a story that he had uh, to help him see that there's a way to, to gain uh, triumph over adversity, would you say, Craig? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to that. So Wednesday, 25th of September um, for the speakers initiates key talks and 
today, this was our key conversation with Craig. So thank you for your time, Craig. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.